Welcome, everyone. I'm Randy Stott, publisher and editor-in-chief, and I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Ask the Expert. And today, we're going to talk about the future of gear manufacturing. Before I begin, though, I'm going to give each of our panelists an opportunity to introduce himself. So, Joel, why don't you start? Hi, sure. I am Joel Nidig. I'm the Director of Research and Development at ITAMCO. ITAMCO is a precision gear manufacturer. Um, we uh, started in 1955, so we're a family-owned business. Um, my grandfather started the company, um, so I'm a third generation, and uh, been doing a lot in the um, uh, startup world, and uh, have uh, commercialized several products, and um, uh, ma mainly focusing on a lot of uh, research grants with government. That's what I've been doing recently, um, and uh, working with a lot of universities on some early research. John? I'm uh, John Parati. I'm Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Gleason Corporation. I've been with Gleason for 37 years. Uh, Gleason's a global leader in gear technology, everything ranging from design software to production machines, uh, the related tooling and uh, aftermarket products and services. We uh, have manufacturing plants on four continents and typically selling to customers in more than 50 countries every year. Thank you, John. Carlos? Yeah, I'm Carlos Wink with Eaton. I work as a chief engineer based in Galesburg, Michigan. Have been with the company for 30 plus years. So it's in fact something that John and I have in common. So I have been with Eaton for 37 years, to be more precise. And um, kind of work at two different transmission plants in Brazil uh, before moving to the US in 2006. I'm kind of working at Eaton's uh, engineering center at Galesburg, Michigan. So Eaton does all kind of uh, transmission products from passenger cars to heavy duty trucks. So we work in the internal combustion engine market and also electrical vehicles, going all the way from precision gears to single speed gearboxes to multi-speed transmissions for um, all kinds of commercial vehicles. So Eaton also does uh, contract manufacturing, so make to print gears, kind of precision gears for um, electrical vehicles. And Karsten. Yeah, my name is Karsten Stahl. I'm a full professor at the Technical University Munich in Germany and director of the Gear Research Center uh, known as FZG. Uh, FZG, we do research for more than 70 years on any aspect of gears, powertrain systems, so NVH, power strings, material hardening, um, efficiency, uh, any aspect you can think of. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you all for being here today. And before I begin with the list of questions that our editors have put together, I'd like to let the audience know that you're also welcome to participate. So if any of you have a question that you would like to ask our panelists, just raise your hand and we'll get you a microphone. And with that, let's begin. So gentlemen, what global trends will shape the gear manufacturing industry of the future? Who'd like to start? Karsten, go ahead. So, uh, I'm not from industry, I'm from university, so I, I think I'm a good observer of the uh, situation when people come to a university and ask questions, and everything is EV now. So, EV is um, uh, dominating the changes in gear industry. I think what we will see is um, a change from 25 plus minus gears to down to four or maybe six gears in EV transmission, so the number of gears will be reduced, but the demands on the gears will rise, so efficiency is more important. Um, also, NVH is, is the topic, so NVH means uh, if you can hear the gear, it's not acceptable, so NVH uh, will reduce um, distortions, uh, increase the um, the, the demands on, on the um, layout, on the design of gears. But what I said before, the number of gears is reduced. So um, we will see um, the, the, the number of gears in powertrain of cars is uh, very strong in, in overall industry. We will see a shrinkage of the production of gears. That's um, a fact. 
Yeah, that's the way we see that as well. So we've got fewer components, fewer number of gears compared to the traditional uh, IC vehicles. And on the other side, is kind of gears with higher quality, so more difficult to make them. And, and that's an interesting thing, because we're going to have fewer components, but much higher volumes compared to what we have today. John? Well, I, I think if you take a step back, you know, the, the mega trends that are out there, it you know, sort of starts with sustainability, which means a lot of different things, but part of the comp one component of sustainability, you know, is renewable energy, and that's what in part is driving the electrical, electric vehicles, uh, whether it be battery or, or fuel cell. Um, but there's other aspects of renewable energy, uh, solar, wind, these kinds of things, which also influence the gear industry. Um, and I, I think another megatrend is the broad context of automation. You know, everything becoming some type of electromechanical actuated device that has some s software or some intelligence driving it. And so even if we believe that uh, the number of gears in an automobile may be, let me even just say an automobile transmission, mm -hmm. may be less in the future. Um, you know, our point of view, my point of view is that there's also a, a continuing rise in electromechanical type actuation devices. And so it may not be fewer gears overall, but it may have to pivot uh, to different opportunities, or the growth may be in other opportunities. And Joel, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I have to agree with everyone. And um, I, I also think that uh, not only for the EV market, um, where you're having those gears supplied to the to the actual manufacturing uh, and of those of those vehicles, but also I think that. Um, the extraction of commodities, so everything that's the rare earth materials that are having to come out of the ground to, to build all these um, new vehicles is uh, quite enormous. And so I think a lot of that is going to propel, um, you know, all the mining, um, all the, you know, all the oil and gas that powers the EV vehicles as we try to build up the wind and solar um, to supply those and the battery production that has to be uh, the capacitors and all those things that have to be built. Um, so I, I really think that, yeah, commodities will drive uh, the gear market. Um, and I think we're going to see um, a lot higher oil for longer um, because of the demand for energy um, until we can get to, you know, those net zero demand that people are looking for. I also think that AI is driving a lot of it, not just AI from a it, you know, making things more efficient, but AI for the boards. So all the chips and all those things, once again, it's all rare earth uh, minerals and materials that go inside of those, um, just like for um, EV. And uh, it takes a lot of copper and nickel and a lot of different things to, to make all these things function. Um, so that's a huge, huge demand that's, that's coming along. Very good, thank you. And taking a look at those trends that you've all just discussed, um, what do you believe will be the most significant changes to gear manufacturing because of those trends? Well, I, since Gleason's heavily involved in gear manufacturing, I can start. Um, If you take the subject of uh, electric vehicles, you know, today uh, I always describe it as some of the designs out there are better than aerospace quality, but wanted in mass production. So that's a little bit of a tall task. Um, uh, you have tolerances that people are looking for, form error, things like this that are sometimes in the range of one and a half micron. And again, they want to try to produce this in mass production. So it's, uh, they're also looking for surface finishes, which are, you know, uh, RARZ roughness measures that are, you know, sub micron. And uh, uh, so it requires some new processes, um, polish grinding. Um, but the thing I always 
gravitate to first and where Gleason's had a big part of its focus is inspection. Uh, if you are going to try to hold those tolerances, you just can't rely upon some statistical inspection of every 100, 200, 300 parts. Uh, uh, today you need more in-process inspection where you're inspecting all gear teeth and potentially the full flank uh, form. And that's part of what we're, we've been working on with some of our products. And, and the only way you can control uh, the process is with data. So this gets you into the whole world of digital manufacturing and, and data because you need the production equipment and the inspection equipment, almost real time sharing data. You can superimpose AI, other tools on top of it to be able to then learn from that data. This is a good gear. These are the sensors on the machine that's telling me how the machine's behaving when something's good, when something's moving a half micron, and, and how you, you know, within these very tight control limits. And putting that all together is, is what's required. Sorry for the long answer, but. No, you thank know, you, John. It's a demanding requirement, so. Anybody else who wants to comment on what changes will happen in gear manufacturing because of these trends? Yeah, I think, I think I agree with John. So there will be more in-process control for the gears with the more stringent tolerances. And uh, I think we, we need to do that. And uh, also more kind of process automation and kind of um, robots to, to help in manufacturing because of those large volumes, um, along with a better process to finish like ring gear. So we are seeing more kind of uh, ring gears in uh, motor applications for electrical vehicles. So we also need to think about process to kind of hard finish those ring gears things like that to lower surface finish and improve quality. Kirsten? We recently made, made a study about the evolution of machine elements, not only gears, but other machine elements uh, across the last 20 odd years. And we saw that every year, the uh, performance of gears is increased by about 4%. How is that happening? One thing is process control. So uh, today, hard finishing is, is standard. Uh, 20 years ago, it was not standard. Quality is, is going to a level which uh, was um, aerospace uh, standard in the past. Now it's mass production. Um, next is material. So inclusions, uh, quality of, of the material. But one point I think is a very important um, understanding. Understanding um, not only reduce the tolerances, but what is the nominal? What is the geometry, the nominal geometry? What is um, the hardening depth, um, the profile, residual stresses? So what is what we are aiming for before we reduce the tolerances? And there's a lot of research going on and a lot of research required. We have the fall technical meeting uh, on, on the first floor and we discuss about um, minor improvements which will add up to the 4% at the end of the year, every year. Thank you. What do you think will be the greatest challenges for gear manufacturers moving forward? Joel? Um, yeah, I think one of the ones we're already seeing is material. So um, when you're, if you're, you know, in that uh, kind of that early pipeline, um, of the of the supply chain, it's it's definitely very challenging. Um, there are, uh, you know, once again, the the material requirements are becoming more complicated, um, and also, yeah, you have to when you start when you start removing all those materials, you start exposing things that you know, uh, as mentioned. So I think that's going to become. Um, uh, and that's a lot of things we're doing. We're doing a lot of material um, uh, uh, early research um, as far as the additive manufacturing goes. So, you know, for small lot sizes, we can print those items. We can actually put, um, you know, different substrate in where we need more strength or, you know, maybe lay the, lay the material a different way than um, what might be forged or, or uh, what have you. So... Um, we're not, obviously the additive's not there to a forging yet, but we're definitely uh, at the casting and, and better um, than a casting. And, and we're seeing um, um, some as rolled uh, capabilities that are even getting there. So, but I think um, the challenges are, are definitely, uh, there's gonna be a lot of 
need for material sciences and and um, uh, and more like the the tip modifications and things that are required um, that are coming out for uh, noise reduction and and better strength in a smaller package. That's that's definitely happening too. Thank you, Joel. Um, I would say building on that is a, a trained workforce. I think at least today that is, you know, by far one of the great challenges that uh, our industry faces. Of course, that's a big part of the AGMA's mission, appropriately so. Um, and, and uh, you know, I would say the second thing I think about is, uh, you know, the ability to continue to invest. So the financial resources to continue to invest to be able to meet the quality requirements as well as the productivity requirements will continue to require uh, incremental investment. So uh, the ability for smaller companies to be able to make those investments I think will be one of the challenges that needs to be overcome. Thank you, John. Yeah, I, Carlos? I think, yeah, I think I would uh, add also, b besides materials, so I think the other challenge is to uh, kind of lower surface roughness of uh, the gears. So there's a trend to move to ultra low cost lubes, like four and a half cent stock lubricants. And that, along with the trend of electric motors to go to a higher speed. So today we are kind of in the ballpark of uh, 16, 18,000 RPM. So let's say that in five, 10 years from now, we go to 25,000 RPM motors. So that's gonna add a, quite a challenge to the, mm -hmm. to the gears to, to survive in that environment with a ultra low viscosity fluid and uh, running at high, much higher speeds. And that means not only kind of the lambda ratio, the small film thickness between the surface, but also the number of cycles that will be accumulated on the first stage gears. So it'll be a challenge term of, in terms of finding the right materials to survive to the, those, that environment along with the kind of surface roughness. And the challenge is how do we make those gears in a kind of a short cycle time, right? Because to do a polish grind or any isotropic finish to lower the surface finish, that adds a quite a bit of uh, cycle time. And that means to make the same amount of gears that we need to produce that makes more equipment that we need, more pieces of equipment. That means that increases our investment. And that's one of the challenges that we have today, how to make all those gears with a lower investment and also how to reduce tooling cost. Thank you, Carlos. So get, getting to the 4% every year means uh, changing something. So changing materials, but also being ready for the industry to implement uh, different processes. Um, in the past, it was very easy, cutting, hardening, and maybe some, some hard finishing. Today, we, we need much more um, refined processes. Um, today, uh, profile modification is standard, crowning and, and uh, tip relief. Several companies already have generated uh, end relief or uh, more sophisticated modifications. In future, it might be uh, a topological control, which means much longer cycle times, much longer. Yeah. Um, but this probably will be the next step, or polish grinding, um, fine grinding, uh, polishing in, in an extra process. Um, many extra processes must be um, an option for the industry to further lower the level, uh, lower the level in, 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 a, in a lake, you see some new mountains coming up uh, which need to be um, worked on. Like a uh, flank fracture was a damage not known before since a couple of years. It's standard because we increased the power density and now um, a flank fracture is a damage we, we need to, to accomplish. Thank you, Carson. All right, gentlemen. What does the shop floor of tomorrow look like? Joel, you want to start? Well, I'm a, we're, we're, we're not a very automated shop. Obviously, we do a really lot bigger stuff. So, um, but I do believe that there's going to be a lot more vision systems. We started employing a lot more um, of that recently. And so vision systems are... Um, because of the workforce having to understand, I mean, we're trying to elevate their, uh, their readiness and there's a lot of um, uh, people retiring out, the, a lot of that core knowledge is left. So having these vision systems that are catching these um, workmanship kind of cap uh, items that are on gears and they can, uh, they're really, I mean, the, the vision systems have become really advanced, especially with adding some AI to those 
um, it's it's become pretty pretty significant. So we started we're starting with the deburr side of 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 things, um, but we're going to advance that to um, more of the uh, traditional gear manufacturing processes and and being able to um, uh, have quicker setups. Um, you know, just simple things like indicating those things, indicating gears in, and and having onboard inspection and those things like that. But um, I really truly believe that uh, the it's going to be more interconnected. You're going to have to um, have these sensors that were discussed on on the on the machines, and um, some of your older equipment might have to be retrofitted with um, some of those sensors. And uh, so I don't think we have to. You know, get rid of all the equipment. Have to buy all brand new, but you'll have to do some retrofitting um, with with some of that uh, those pieces of equipment on your shop. And um, yeah, the the interconnectivity um, AI that's a big buzzword, and it's 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 already been around for a very long. Like machine learning, we've used it in a lot of different products. But um, I think that'll be prol proliferated um, through the shop floor, and people will, people will lean on that. They'll use it a lot more. It'll be integrated with a lot of things. Thank you, Joel. Well, certainly I would agree, you know, automation, but not just automation in a classic sense, but automation that helps facilitate um, repeatability and uh, data collection, because it's really sort of digital manufacturing, I think, that will define the next sort of generation. Um, and so your ability to collect data throughout the process and intelligently interpret it and, and leverage action from it, I think, will, will be what separates uh, the winners from the, uh, lack of a better word, losers mm -hmm. into the future. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree with that in terms of uh, interconnectivity, right, of all the equipments. They're not going... And maybe going one le one level up in terms of not integrating the machines, but also connect that to the manufacturing process, so we can make adjustments on the fly, based on that all that data analytics. And um, I also connect that with supply chain and maintenance in other areas of, of the, the production. One one point I would like to add: um, potentially changing uh, from the conventional furnace to inline hardening inductive hardening. This could make a major change, so we are doing research on that. Then you have one inline production, a uh, very small loop of uh, quality control for the hardening um, uh, system. We are all used to waiting one day to get the gears back and then uh, realizing something is wrong. So this might be a change for tomorrow, mm -hmm. if we do not lose any strength. <laughs> Thank you. How will tomorrow's workforce be different from today's, and what is your organization doing to uh, address the changes? Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of training going on right now. I think um, the the newer workforce obviously is uh, very highly technical on on uh, devices and you know everything. Uh, that you can imagine on applications, but they don't, they lack the, the uh, kind of the core knowledge that, um, that people have developed over 30, 40 years in the business. And so I think um, trying to uh, uh, essentially grab that knowledge, that's one of the things we've been doing at ITAMCO. We've been taking um, some of our guys, usually when they're getting ready to retire with like a, you know, 12 months, we take them in, we video and, and record a lot of the functions that they do. And so being able to take that and then be able to summarize it and analyze it with um, chat GPT or other AI sources and then be able to disseminate that knowledge, it's a very big deal to be able to record or capture that so simplistically and, and be able to uh, disseminate that. So I think the, the workforce of tomorrow is going to have to lean on, you know, the workforce that's currently retiring of today. but. They're gonna um, capturing all that knowledge, um, just like we're doing here today, and being able to uh, disseminate that is really is gonna be really important for our industry to to hold and and to um, present. I I think um, it the the answer varies to some extent. Uh, you know, for for smaller 
suppliers, they're still going to need skilled operators. Um, they're going to have to be able to deal with perhaps tolerances and things that they haven't seen in, in, in the past um, outside of even electric vehicles. And I think in, in larger companies, uh, you, you know, it's a more proliferation of more systems engineers who can manage um, automated intelligent systems um, as opposed to somebody who maybe has hands on the machine um, you know, throughout their work day. So uh, uh, I think you know, developing those systems engineers and who can interpret data and, and intelligence that certainly for the large scale producers will become important. Thank you, John. And, and, and Ethan, so we have a really good program that's named uh, Future Ready, where Ethan um, is kind of uh, having this program to help people into the, into, enter into this digital world with all those uh, new technologies from cybersecurity to kind of data analytics and artificial intelligence. And so there's a bunch of different programs and training opportunities to bring not only the manufacturing folks, but the whole enterprise to this uh, new kind of digital transformation. And so I think that's part of that. And the other part is, uh, as Joe was saying, so how do we train this new generation into the base of gear technology so I think that will be a nice kind of cross training between the existing workforce and the one that's coming to kind of, I think both have, have a lot to learn from the, the base of gear technology and other side to learn from this uh, new technology that are coming in the workplace. So from, tele from the university side, uh, I think it's training the competencies of uh, the people in the process chain, understanding the, the, the impact of, of their contribution is very important. Uh, as we go further and further to the tip, it is important that everybody in the process chain is understanding what to do. Thank you. <clears throat> what are the most important new and evolving technologies that are likely to change the way gears are made? Who wants to start? Karsten, go ahead. I, I start with something maybe surprising, not making gears, but what I see is uh, a, a very big uh, potential and also challenge is a new kind of lubrication. So there are um, lubrication systems, um, polyalkylene glycol with water, uh, which are different from everything we know, reducing the friction by more than 75%, by more than 75%, reducing down to a level which is called super lubricity, but comes with challenges. And I think this is something what uh, from the physics, everybody will say, yes, we need it, but you have water in the transmission. Um, so a lot of changes will be necessary for that. And if you reduce the friction by, by more than 75%, uh, the whole system changes. So maybe you get, go to higher teeth again, change the design of the gear because Friction is no issue anymore. Now you can focus on NVH. So this could be a game changer. And I see that coming in the next five years. And I think skiving. So skiving has been there for a while, right? But it has been become more popular in more recently, last kind of maybe 10 years or so. And so we are kind of uh, expect that we're going to have more and more applications with this skiving, especially for internal gears like ring gears. And uh, I also kind of... Uh, hard skiving or any kind of um, internal honing to help us improve um, the quality and surface reference of ring gears. And um, also another technology I think we need to keep our eyes on is um, additive manufacturing. So that has evolved a lot to a point that I think we might get to a point that we, we might be able to bring that into a high volume production. So I think we are getting closer and closer to that point and that's going to open up completely new uh, opportunities for us in terms of uh, reducing weight of the gears and playing with different materials in the same gears and um, it's going to be kind of a game changer. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily see one big um, trend. I, I see it as it's been really for several decades where 
um, whether it be the materials, um, uh, whether it be different processes that continue to develop, um, uh, not, not just in, in subtractive manufacturing, but in some of the forming processes, and, you know, in plastics, there's newer, uh, stronger materials, more heat resistant materials. Um, uh, you, you have additive, you, you have, um, you know, powder, powdered metal, where again, uh, really in, in, in all these verticals, you continue to see, you know, advancements uh, incrementally. And I think that's what we'll continue to see, you know, for the next five and 10 years. Yeah, and I think, yeah, the additive and the, the new alloys that are coming out, they're being able to come out with um, things that, that can be made pretty um, rapidly on the atomization side. So uh, that's, that's going to be interesting. I also think coatings, there's a lot of uh, research into, um, you know, different uh, uh, ceramic coatings and different things like that that can make things last a lot longer. So that'll be interesting how that progresses, but it's... Very difficult to machine. <laughs> Thank you all. How will data, IT, and cybersecurity play an increasing role in gear manufacturing? I, well, I think, um, I think that uh, the, the, especially on a DOD side, the security is becoming, uh, you've probably heard of CMMC, um, and there's a, uh, there's just a big need where if you're doing anything with the federal government, they're going to require all these stipulations. And so to be NIST 800, um, but then also inter you know, sharing those, um, because we're literally we're sending digital twins to each other when we're sharing, uh, you know, manufacturing processes or, or models or different things like that, um, different requirements. So protecting that no, not only in your own facility, but then outside your four walls will become... Uh, a very big need. So I think um, with um, uh, a lot of the model-based system engineering is going to require a, a much stronger uh, supply chain network beyond what we originally have developed like EDI or just you know sharing from a, a cloud location. I think you're going to have uh, more secure enclaves like blockchain and, and things like that that uh, we'll have to employ. But a lot of this will come with um, with technology that you purchase. So there's there's companies that are going to be providing this. Um, um, I know Microsoft already provides uh, some some type of uh, NIST 800 compliant environments and and things like that. So I think I think there's going to be a lot of uh, you know for smaller manufacturers to be able to get in this space and be able to uh, secure and have have these identities. Um, there's a big buzzword called zero trust that the government's really pushing, and that's what CMMC is really pushing, is that even if, even if somebody were to access your, you know, get inside your network, and, and um, there's still firewalls even within there that everything has to get permission to access something. And, um, and I think that's, that'll be very seamless, I think, to the user as, it, it become, as you buy, as technology advances. But right now, it's definitely a very challenging because right now it's like we have the authentication. You have the two-factor two authentication. I think everybody's got a two-factor authentication or you have a Google Authenticator that you're, you're checking something. Um, so we're already getting those multi-signals, uh, but I think that's going to become even more when we're sharing information back and forth and not wanting to get hacked or taking your machine down. Is, you know, you're afraid to connect your machine to the network because it could get hacked or or you know, your production goes down. So it's definitely a big challenge. Well, um, certainly uh, we're seeing it and living with it almost on a, a daily or weekly basis, whether it be um, the US federal government, but even other governments around the world, but even apart from a government related business, just some of our large uh, multinational uh, customers have very rigorous um, checklists, um, many pages long, that if you want to do business with them, you need to make sure you have the right security protocols. Um, and as Joel said, also 
today, if you want to live in the digital manufacturing world with everything networked together, that also does present uh, IT security risks. So um, having uh, all the right virus protection, all the right monitoring, um, keeping that current on your equipment is, uh, is a pretty big investment. Can I, yeah, I, I, mean, I think, yeah, talking about this digital manufacturing with all that data analytics and data cloud, I think that becomes more and more important to have ways to safeguard uh, our, our, our data in our network. And I recently came across a statistic saying that in the last few years, I think 25% of the cyber attacks were against manufacturing. So the industry that has been most affected by cyber, cyber attacks are kind of manufacturing, like a recent case of Clorox. And that can completely disrupt our, our production, right, uh, and our revenue stream. This becomes pretty really more and more important. I, I think the value of data cannot be overestimated. Um, value of data anywhere in the, in the production chain, which can be used to train AI or to build up neural network to, to better uh, design gears, understand uh, the the potential and, and to use any potential of, of the gears further and also in the field. So running gears, uh, all the data is very, very valuable um, for condition monitoring or to, um, yeah, to, to, to uh, reduce the uh, over-engineering. I think many uh, transmissions in the world are uh, much, much oversized because we don't know, we don't have the data, and uh, with uh, continuously getting data, you can either apply a condition monitoring system or better design the gears purpose made. Thank you. We've touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to know from each of you your perspective on what are the real hot topics in, in R&D as it, it applies to gears? So um, I would like to start with a no, and I'm surprised that none of the speakers here um, spoke about additive, additive manufacturing. So I, I don't think uh, additive manufacturing will be the big, big player. I, I think there are not, this is a change of time today, there are not the big wins, uh, the, the one thing we need to improve and then everybody, uh, everything gets better. We, we have a, a landscape of so many small improvements. I, I think th this is what describes my point of view best. I have um, nearly 50 PhD working on topics uh, which will not change the world each, but the sum, the total sum of each will get to the 4% every year. So uh, the, the big wins were in the past. Now we are working on small, small little steps. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, at Eaton we are working at different programs to try to kind of uh, meet our customers' requirements or anticipate their requirements as kind of going to uh, increase power dense of our gearboxes. And we're trying some different things, like novel things like playing with different architectures to see if we can reduce the number of gears, number of components, and create the same, same number of uh, output speeds. And there's also another program that we're working on around making the gears lighter, kind of lightweight to reduce to help reduce the overall uh, gearbox weight. And things like uh, playing with different uh, web, gear web geometries, so different materials, different ways of uh, uh, putting them together to reduce weight. So everything around weight and uh, lightweight gears and also uh, improving efficiency, overall efficiency of the gearbox. And on the top of that, as I mentioned, so additive manufacturing, we think that's coming uh, to kind of a high production volumes and um, something I, I think we need to keep our eyes on that because that might kind of disrupt the traditional manufacturing process of gears. Yeah. Um, building a little bit on what um, Karsten said, you know, at, at Gleason our development dollars are spent across many areas also trying to address some of the things we've been talking about like electrification, electric vehicles and some of the technology developments there, but I, I like to tie it sort of all together into a broader ecosystem. You know, we, we go from design to manufacturing to measuring in a closed loop, and then effectively 
how you have bi-directional communication between these and, and, and using all of these to, to optimize the entire value chain. And so a lot of our development money is not just spent on the individual topics, but also how we stitch it together, um, where I think that's where you can get you know, a large benefit down the road. Yeah, and we're, and we're definitely, I mean, obviously we're in additive um, doing, and I think there's, a, there's some material gains there that are really exceptional, especially for downhole oil um, drilling and things like that, um, and then getting into some higher temps. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that we've started looking at is, is the, well, like I mentioned before, the vision systems and being able to, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of custom work holding when you get into manufacturing, especially gear manufacturing, and being able to uh, apply, there's always tool pressure and different things like that, but, and, and having to have the perfect, you know, indicated part in, where we kind of see is that if the vision system can capture some of those anomalies and then compensate the control back for that movement, and maybe um, that's that's a big, we think there's some major, uh, and, and that's what we're doing right now on the deburr, with, with some of our deburring projects is is you can basically set a set a ring gear in a fixture. It's, it could be cocked at all kinds of different angles, um, not precisely put in place by an operator. And um, and still be able to uh, maintain all the d the dimensions that's required uh, and meet per print. So those are kind of those uh, quick change and 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 things that we're trying to get faster and better better cycle times. Thank you. We've talked a little bit about this, but I'd like to know from your perspective what industries will shape the future of gear manufacturing, and in what ways. Yeah, I think I think the, the whole mobility is gonna kind of affect the gear industry. And um, when we think not only about um, electrification, but as autonomous vehicles, right? So if we think about um, a vehicle that a household that had two or three vehicles might in the in the future have just one, right? Because the vehicle can drive you to work and come back home to serve your wife and her errands, and uh, or you can use that vehicle for running kind of a more um, shared ride, like Uber, autonomous. And we, when we think also about uh, aerospace, right, with uh, air mobility, when we think about those small aircrafts for an EV thought and electric uh, vertical takeoff and land. And so that's also gonna, we're gonna see more and more of those, of those vehicles uh, in, the, in the near future. And one thing of those is um, when we think about the kind of small, typical small aerospace environment, but with those vehicles we see kind of 10, 8, 12 uh, uh, propeller drivers. So when we multiply that by the number of gears, so it's going to be a volume between kind of a traditional aerospace environment and a high volume production of automotive. So it's going to, how we're going to deal with that. So I think that's going to be an interesting thing as well. It's going to shape the, the, the size of the, the, some of the gear industries, how they kind of the traditional aerospace suppliers, they move to a high, more higher volume production or how the automotive folks move to kind of something in between to kind of supply the demand for those um, EV tall applications. No, I, I certainly, the automotive industry has historically been a very important element in the gear world and even while there could be fewer gears in the future, the challenges and, and, and the value added to make those gears may not be proportional in some respects. Uh, so that will continue to be a big driver. And also miniaturization, you know, if you think about the electromechanical devices and things like that, um, I think that will be some interesting trends to watch. Um, and again, whether they be plastic gears or form gears or machine gears, some combination of all of that, but uh, you know, I, I think that's another area where you will continue to see uh, changes and potentially higher volumes. 
May I rephrase your question? Uh, you asked for what industries, and uh, I, I think it's easier to answer what application will will have an impact on, on gear industry. And um, I think that, that is clearly seen whenever you need high torque, high forces, you need gears. So the, the positive locking of gears, the physics say if you have high torque, high forces, you need gears for high speed and um, high RPM, uh, electric engines are uh, very suitable. And the combination of both high speed and high torque will always require gears in applications which might not be expected for gears, like um, the turbine of air engines. Um, we see many turbines now with power gearboxes uh, to reduce the speed of the, the turbofan. And this is an application which is um, obvious, uh, perfect for gears or any actuators. So um, in the past uh, it was manual, so now the car has more than 100 actuators for everything, vents and, and uh, ev every movement. So this is perfect for gears and not for direct drives. And also wind turbines. Um, one of the last um, manufacturers of wind turbines now changed back to from direct drive to geared drive. Yes, of course, you have slow speed. You need gears for slow speed, high torque to change it to high speed. So I think this will drive industry in, in, in the future. Always when you have uh, slow speed, high torque, you need gears. Very good. What should gear manufacturers do today to prepare for tomorrow? Well, you did the first step and come to the Motion Power Show um, <laughs> to Expo. Uh, I think that, um, yeah, I think being part of um, these, the group AGMA and, and various groups and, and going to, um, uh, you know, I think there's going to be a big convergence. So in convergence technologies, you're, you're not only bringing gear manufacturing, but you're bringing all the other um, additive or other subtractive technologies. Um, you're bringing AI. So as you as you start integrating technologies, um, that's the that's the best way to, to learn because you can see where oh okay that could fit and I could adapt this item to that and and make this better. And so I think you know like I said yeah I think looking at convergent technologies is really important. Well, it might sound a little bit self-serving, but uh, you know the first thing I think about is invest. Um, Gear uh, equipment, gear solutions do, in most cases, offer pretty good return on investment. Um, of course, that's not an absolute, but uh, the technology's evolved enough and there's still enough of a very old installed base of equipment that there's, there's pretty potent uh, return on investment. Um, so with that obviously though comes other requirements like we've talked about skilled workforce and other things but um, I, I think making intelligent investments is critical for the gear producer of the future to to be successful yeah i, I think a couple of things would be big ones in my opinion is labor right how to prepare the workforce for for the future and, um, and the other thing would be around supply chain. So I think strategically, how do we strengthen our supply chain and partner um, partnership network? And perhaps looking for moving from a, a kind of a linear, low, lowest cost vision to a more kind of a multi-dimension um, approach, looking at other things like speed and risk and, you know, maybe near shore and some of the suppliers and look at this partnership with suppliers and other partners in the industry. I think a, a good recipe for being ready for future is being ready to impl implement changes. So keeping the ear open, absorb all the changes and, and improvements, go to MPT, go to conferences, collaborate with university, understand what, what are the improvements which are possible and being ready to invest and to, to implement changes. If a, a production, when, when you see the, the line uh, every year improvement of, of the, the, the um, performance of gears means something has changed in the past 
and in future it has to continue to change. So machines, processes, materials, um, design, um, combination with lubrication, the whole topology, everything needs to be reconsidered and, and be probably changed in future. Good advice from everyone. Does anybody from the audience want to ask our panelists any questions? All right, then. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, most especially our four panelists, and uh, helping us put together this edition of Ask the Expert. And thanks to our audience for your attention and time.